Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Niho. Joining me on set is Shaka Sali himself, aka the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. I am hugely terrific. How are you, I'm the doing well. academic kid? Uh, good to see you again. Good to see you too. But uh, what happened? Uh, it looks like uh, when I look at you, it just looks like I'm looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking up to you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you must be in good company, don't yeah. worry. Uh, a warm welcome to you all our Facebook followers are watching us live. Uh, Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to talk to Shaka and ask us some uh, pertinent uh, questions. Uh, today we'll be talking about a wide range of issues, uh, but before that, uh, let's start on a sad note. Uh, our dear friend, uh, a friend to this uh, show, to Straight Talk Africa and all the other shows, here at the Voice of America, Dr. Suleiman Nyang uh, passed away yesterday and would like to pay a special tribute to, uh, to him. And uh, our deepest condolences go to his uh, family. Uh, Shaka, uh, Doctor, the passing of Dr. Suleiman Nyang, uh, this is a guy, a remarkable guy, who has been on your show several times, uh, not only on your show, but he has been like an in-house uh, analyst for the Voice of America. Your thoughts? First of all, to be honest with you, uh, Paul, I don't think I can frankly find the right words with which to express myself about the late Dr. Suleiman Nyang. Suleiman was a colleague. He was my big brother. He was my intellectual brother. He was a teacher. He was uh, a role model. Yeah. He was a fiercely Pan-Africanist. He was a man that, uh, who had hopes that someday, at least in his life, he would see Africa develop into a major power, into a continent that uh, he would feel very, very, very proud about. It's very unfortunate that uh, he has passed away uh, before realizing that. He's not only someone that uh, contributed to Straight Talk Africa, but I have to say, among the top three that I can actually put my fingers on, he was one of those people that uh, remarkably uh, contributed and uh, supported Straight Talk Africa. I can put him in the same company as Emila Woods, and last but not least, Professor George. Aite, Professor George Aite. These were three building blocks, three key people that have contributed enormously to the development and the success of Straight Talk Africa since its inception. We're talking about uh, a program that began on August uh, the 2nd, the year 2000. Without these people, Straight Talk Africa probably wouldn't still be on air. We had so many uh, opportunities and uh, sometimes, in fact, uh, uh, exchanged some social amenities, as you know. He yeah. sometimes invited us, along with our, our other friends, including, of course, uh, uh, someone that I refer to as uh, uh, my brother from another mother, Paul Cisco. We would go to Silver Springs, uh, where he had a seat at the diner. He liked the diner. And remember, he took us for lunch or dinner at the Cuban restaurant, where I like to eat the Cuban beans. And I can also remember that uh, I, together with one of my former bosses, both at UCRA when he was the editor of the Makasagabe Papers Project, and then here at The Voice of America, Dr. Gregory Alonzo Pirio, popularly known as Greg. Uh, I call him the kid from Fontana, California. He calls me in turn the kid from Kavali. We would invite Suleiman and actually go to Arlington near where I live. And we would go to what used to be a Brazilian restaurant. And now it is a laundromat. Yes. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. 
we would go there and we'd eat this Brazilian meat and you name it and stuff like that and talk about Africa and talk about the world. This guy was remarkably intelligent. He was a guy that I would refer to as a, a mobile archives, really, or a working database for that matter. But above and beyond, he exuded humility. He was down to earth. And mind you, this is a guy who came from the Gambia. But to be very honest with you, his country, if there was such a country, it was Africa. Uh, a, a former diplomat as well. You also served as a diplomat a before diplomat. getting into uh, really academia. That is true. And uh, he lived in the United States for very, very many years, several decades. You, you, you know, what is uh, remarkable, uh, he, uh, I did a profile of him uh, in uh, uh, maybe about uh, seven years ago, and he told me how he arrived here in the United States. Uh, uh, he came in 19... 1962. 62. That's when he first arrived here. That is Went through the school system and he started, uh, I, I remember he, him talking about how he started teaching at Howard University in 1972. 1972? Absolutely. That is he when... was one of the lucky few people who came, uh, I think, uh, uh, during that time when I think it was uh, Kennedy who had opened up uh, uh, America for Africans giving scholarship like uh, Obama's father coming through the same uh, thing. So he was one of those lucky few students who came from Africa and benefited from uh, the gifts uh, that America has given so many of us. Very interesting. Uh, when you talk about uh, 1972, yes. I am looking at uh, a young, dashing paratroop lieutenant. That was Mike Sully when I still had my slave name, Mike, before transforming into Shaka Sally. Uh, in terms of legacy, when you look at uh, his contributions uh, to, to Africa, his contribution in terms of writing African literature, African politics, African uh, uh, religion, in terms of Islam and whatever, he made enormous contributions uh, to, in that field. Uh, yeah. In terms of legacy, what would you say his legacy has been? I think that uh, there's no question that he would be remembered as one of those people, like I said, who was fiercely pan-Africanist. He was a bridge builder. He was a uniter. He was not a guy that uh, would be supporting, for example, uh, the United States president's project. I'm talking about the war that uh, obviously President uh, uh, Donald Trump would like to build the south, you know, south of the United States, uh, preventing uh, uh, people from Latin America and what have you coming to the United States. He was not that kind of person. He was a person who wished everybody well. He was a person that uh, uh, was very easily accessible. He was a person who always looked at you and looked for something good in you so that he can praise it. Just like, of course, uh, uh, the award-winning author, Alex Haley. One author, of his favorite. The author of Roots, of course. Mm. The author of uh, Malcolm X, who said, find something good in someone and praise it. That was the type of person Suleiman Young was. You know, speaking of uh, the roots, uh, one of the gifts that he gave me when I first met him and started interacting with him was that book authored by Alex Haley, The Roots. Really? Absolutely. And you know, of course, uh, yeah. it triggered, uh, uh, you know, a series of uh, television, you know, uh, documentaries and all kind of stuff, programs and whatever, which were also equally award-winning. And I should also note, by the way, that, uh, again, Suleiman Young will probably be remembered for participating in a major Straight Talk Africa edition, which was in 2001, when a Ugandan major opposition figure, Colonel, uh, Colonel Dr. Chiza Vesege, retired, but certainly not tired, in Studio 18 at the time. And along with, of course, uh, the then uh, Ugandan ambassador, uh, Edith, Bafakurera uh, Sempara, playing potential extraordinary. Here we were in Studio 18, talking about, analyzing about Yoweri Museveni, the Ugandan president at the time. 
and uh, talking about um, how it was incredible for Bessiger to have been able to escape uh, from Uganda and they end up in the United States, in Washington. So anybody writing a book about such uh, an incredible, you know, historic uh, Straight Talk Africa edition will always, of course, look at uh, Suleiman Nyang as one of the key participants in that program. Uh, before we move on to the other topic, uh, what would you like your fans, especially people who watch uh, Straight Talk every, every uh, Wednesday, uh, how would you like your fans to remember Dr. Suleiman Nyang? I think that uh, if I had a way of putting it, I would say that uh, my fans should look at uh, an individual uh, who always wanted and always was able to at least in my view, uh, was willing and able to offer his best. He was, mind you, the person that uh, believed in being the best that he could be. And there's no doubt in my mind that intellectually he was able to meet that type of threshold. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, I, I can testify that uh, I learned a lot uh, from just uh, interacting with him, getting to know him on a very personal level. I did too, uh, like I said earlier, among other things, frankly, he was my teacher. He was, in a way, somebody that inspired me. And frankly, he taught me how to be simple, firm but simple, and uh, to exude humility and to be a bridge builder, not a war builder. Uh, that's a perfect uh, uh, segue to our next segment. You're talking about a bridge builder. Let's go to Ethiopia. Uh, the reformist uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed who is once again uh, cracking the whip uh, for the first time. Uh, this is a guy who came in. Uh, we have a female president now in Ethiopia. We have a female High Court, uh, Supreme it, Court judge. Or is it the uh, Chief of Justice? Uh, yes, so, uh, president of the of, of the judiciary there. Uh, we have ten female cabinet members, uh, female cabinet members out of 20, making it a 50-50 split. Are you and surprised that uh, he actually does have uh, a soft spot for people who happen to be female? That's why I called him a bridge builder. Let's, uh, but have you not heard the story about his mother? His mother, at the time when Abbe Ahmed was seven years old or young, his mother told him that he would be the seventh ruler or leader of Ethiopia. Wow. His mother. What do you make of him? What do you make of his policies, these changes, these reforms that he's bringing in Ethiopia? I think, uh, one, obviously, when you're talking about politicians, you're talking about uh, leaders and what have you, one has to be very cautious or at least cautiously optimistic. But I think that when you look at uh, what this man has been able to accomplish in such a very short time, you would definitely have to look at him as someone that uh, increasingly looks like a legitimate new bleed of African leaders. Yeah. And I think, frankly, a lot of leaders on the African continent, and even those who are yet to be leaders in terms of being presidents or prime ministers should take a cue from Abe Ahmed. Look at the, the manner in which he is crack, you know, cracking against corruption, for example. Look at these top security you know, officials and what have you, mm -hmm. who he has uh, uh, apprehended and all kind of stuff. It's not simply because he doesn't like them. It's because he says, uh, or he alleges, and he seems to have the evidence to boot, that these people have actually been, uh, in a sense, they have been benefiting from an industry of corruption. Uh, how about, uh, let's go to a comment here about, uh, f uh, in Ethiopia, actually from Ethiopia, uh, let's go to Fru Bekele uh, in Ethiopia. What do you think about Abi Ahmed's policies in Ethiopia, especially in light of uh, the arrests that were made earlier today? Uh, of uh, several uh, military and intelligence officers? I think, frankly, first of all, the jury is already out. Uh, if he does have evidence, uh, which he says he does, and he probably does because, after all, he used, in fact, to be heading the, you know, the intelligence service and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if 
he does have the evidence, uh, he has to make sure that uh, these individuals uh, have the benefit of due process. Take them through uh, the process, the due process, and let the courts decide based on evidence. Let the court decide their fate. Mm. Uh, le 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 let's go to another comment here. Let's go to uh, uh, Godfrey uh, in Uganda. Do you see any young leaders becoming presidents uh, given the level of militarization and commercialization of politics in Africa? You know, first of all, let's face it, uh, society is not static. Society is dynamic. And for that reason, I see young people, I see people reflecting the changing demographics in tandem with social media. I see them taking their leadership roles in society on the African continent, and in fact, making a huge difference, making things work differently from the way, for example, my generation has actually done. Uh, you are watching uh, Shaka Extra Time. Uh, Shaka Sali himself is back in the studio and is taking uh, your questions. Uh, today we are talking about a wide range of issues. As we speak now, we are talking about Ethiopia. Uh, let's go to another comment here. Uh, do you think uh, Abi Ahmed, this is a comment uh, on Facebook, do you think I, Abi Ahmed is the kind of leader that uh, Ethiopians have been waiting for? Well, I don't know whether it is Abi Ahmed or whether it is someone else, but at least now we do have some tangible evidence. We do have incontrovertible evidence in the person of Abi Ahmed. And so far, in such a very, very short time, if you can imagine the sort of significant reforms that he has been able to embark on, the fact that he, have, he has had the courage, he has had the wisdom, he has had the opportunity to acknowledge, for example, the role that women, women play, and he has been able to reach out to them so that together with their main counterparts and what have you, can develop Ethiopia. I mean, Ethiopia is an ancient, an ancient country. It started with being an empire. It was ruled by uh, uh, essentially people who you would call emperors, really. Uh, you know, the, you had uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, for example, the last one, in fact. Uh, he, made, he also did his part because, let's face it, mm. perhaps without Haile Selassie, you probably wouldn't have had the Organization of African Unity being born back mm. in 1963 and later, of course, which evolved into the African Union. He was a visionary. He was a visionary. So like Africa of course, needed a capital, a place where they can come together and sit and talk about their own issues. Alongside, of course, uh, people like the Osajefo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the kid from Nkrofo, and people like uh, uh, Kano Gamaro, Abdel Nasser of Egypt, and people like Ben Bera of Algeria, you know, to name a few. Uh, so I think that uh, Abe Ahmed, like I said, uh, can possibly be looked at really as a legitimate new bleed, not only of Ethiopian leaders, but in fact of African leaders. When I talk about that, I'm reminded of the expression, a new bleed of African leaders, which was coined here in the nation's capital, Washington, mm. during the Clinton administration, mm. referring to uh, specific African leaders then, beginning from Asimara in Eritrea. You're talking about uh, uh, a man called uh, Isaiah Safawaki. You're talking about uh, south of that, it was Meres Zenawi in Addis Ababa. And then he went down south, farther south. You're talking about your William 70 in Kampala. Mm. And to a certain degree, you, they even talked about uh, Rora Desiree Kabila in Congo Kinshasa. You might have said also, probably added, uh, Paul Kagame. But Paul Kagame at that time was vice president and defense minister. Obviously, he was the de facto uh, president, de facto ruler, really. He was the <laughs> man that called the shots, even though Pasteur Bizmungu was arguably President Pasteur Bizmungu. He was the guy who had the title with no authority.
Uh, and sure. those people were a major disappointment, really, because they did not evolve into what was supposed to be a new bleed of African leaders changing Africa for the benefit of Africans. They never did that. It seems to me that when you look at Abe Ahmed, you are looking at something rather unique. And like I said, I think people should actually take a cue from some of these things that this man is doing. Because this man is actually making remarkable changes in a country that has never known democracy, for example, since its inception. It may very well be that this actually could very well be the beginning, really, of the end of dictatorship in Ethiopia. Uh, Shaka, it's interesting that uh, you say that, uh, I think let's go to a comment uh, in line with uh, Pan-Africanism. Uh, this person wants to know, uh, Alex Luima, uh, can Africa develop without uh, help from outside, uh, considering that Abiy Ahmed is making all these changes? Uh, just within, uh, he hasn't gone outside to seek external help to come and make these changes, which means it's possible for some things to be done in some of these countries. Uh, taking a cue from Abiy Ahmed is, can Africa develop without external help? You know, I think most of the things that uh, Africa needs can actually be done by Africans themselves. If there are certain things that Africa needs that does not, not, does not have, of course you, you can either borrow or you can import or you can buy because Africa has been playing the role of actually building other nations, other empires, other superpowers. If you look at the incredible wealth of Africa, for example, mm. if you look at Colton, you look at Colton, it's a strategic metal uh, that plays a very important role, perhaps, in the production, for example, of the cell phone, the laptop computer. You're talking about X-rays. You're talking about a lot of things. And it is found where? In the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the eastern part of the Congo, where, frankly, if you can go there, and you and I have had the opportunity to go there, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can look around and say, wait a minute, how can this possibly be? the origin, really, of Colton. How can this be the origin of this and that? Because people, when you look at people in that neighborhood, they do not even look in terms of economics. They do not even look like they actually have an economy built on sweet potatoes. No. And yet, when you look at Colton, you look at uh, the Silicon Valley and all that kind of stuff, you look at incredible lifestyle. Yeah, and Congo goes beyond uh, Colton. They have a lot of diamonds. They have a lot of gold. Any mineral that you can think of, they have it in Congo. You name it. I mean, let's face it. Uh, when you talk about the nuclear bombs, for example, that the United States used uh, during the Second World War uh, to bomb Japan. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Nagasaki. Yeah. Guess where the raw material came from, the minerals? From Congo. Interesting. From Interesting. Congo. Uh, let's stay in uh, Congo. Uh, as we speak, uh, the opposition uh, coalition came up with a fronted leader uh, who was, uh, uh, as of yesterday, they ha we had hoped that uh, the coalition was going to hold. Uh, today, one of the largest uh, opposition parties in uh, Congo uh, said that, uh, led by uh, Felix uh, Kisekedi, said that they are pulling out of the coalition. Uh, to front one candidate. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I think uh, it should be pointed out that uh, the main, the United, you know, uh, opposition chose an, an, uh, uh, an individual uh, by the name Martin Fayou, uh, a man from uh, the business background and all the kind of stuff. I think that uh, Kisekedi and uh, your friend uh, Vettel uh, Kamere, I, I, I gather that uh, both have decided that uh, they're not going to play ball. But guess what? There have been some demonstrations, as a matter of fact, in some parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. And these people were actually saying that these two individuals, uh, you're talking about Kamere and, uh, uh, and uh, Felix Kisekedi, mm -hmm. that these are traitors. Because let's face it, I don't know obviously whether the process of choosing uh, Fayul, to what extent was democratic and what have you, 
but probably they should have actually given uh, the gentleman a chance because let's face it it makes it very easy for the incumbent government's candidate mm -hmm. to go through right now in fact it is like a major political present that yeah. is given you mean Emmanuel Ramazani Sh Shadari yes a man who was uh, a former uh, interior minister for Brother uh, Shadri, yeah for, for, for uh, Joseph Kabira right right yeah and of course uh, there are people who say that uh, when you look at uh, that particular gentleman uh, that you are also uh, reminded of what happened thousands of miles away in Moscow the Russian capital when uh, uh, a man called Putin Vladimir Putin reached a point where he could not uh, shift to the constitutional goal posts, he decided instead to choose somebody that was very malleable, a man called Medvedev, who actually served as president in an in inter intervening, you know, one term, so that later he actually bounces back as president with obviously some new, uh, you know, remarkable constitutional changes that not only uh, uh, made sure that uh, even the term is prolonged from five to six or whatever, but also, of course, he becomes the president. So there are people who are actually saying that when you look at what is happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, when you look at um, uh, Shadali, uh, that Emmanuel, I think he was called Emmanuel. Yes. Uh, Emmanuel? Emmanuel Ram Ramazani, Ramazani Shadari, Sh Shadari yes. uh, that you are probably looking at Medved because Joseph Kabila could probably, after one term, bounce back. Uh, Bartaka, we've seen examples of leaders uh, handpicking uh, their, pre uh, th their successors uh, and it hasn't worked. Uh, we saw a scenario in uh, Zambia a couple years ago where Chilwa was handpicked and it ended up uh, backfiring. Uh, 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 we've seen uh, most Chiru recent... Chiruba, Chiruba was not handpicked. S it, was, uh, it, it was, in fact, Chiruba who actually handpicked hand Mwana Wasa. Patrick Leze Mwana, Wasa. Yes. Mwana Wasa. So we've seen situations like that. Most recently we saw in Angola where Jose Eduardo Dos Santos handpicked J-Lo and j -Lo has ended up locking up his own kids. Uh, we saw another scenario like a week ago in Botswana where uh, former president... Uh, uh, ka, uh, uh, Ian Kama, Ian Kama handpicked a successor, and the successor is out. Uh, uh, was out in public at a public forum, lashing out at uh, his uh, uh, predecessor. So, uh, the argument you're making there, uh, I see, uh, it might not make it in the context of Congo. Well, you have to take chances. I mean, let's face it. Uh, it worked in Moscow, in, in Moscow, didn't it? But we are looking at different circumstances here. Well, there may be different circumstances, but you have to give it a chance because politics is supposed to be the art of all possibilities. And if it is the art of all possibilities, you have to try. Okay, very briefly, what are you talking about uh, tomorrow on uh, Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow, interestingly, we are talking about how Africans should not uh, put their faith in individual leaders. Rather, they should, in fact, Put their faith in building strong institutions. That Africa does not need strong men or strong women. It needs strong institutions. Well, on that note, I thank you so much. Uh, it's been an, it's been nice uh, seeing you again and hosting you on another edition of Ashaka Extra Time. I look forward to another one uh, next week. Uh, on that note, I thank you so much. And for now, uh, take care. Talk to you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.